Well, welcome, friends, to week two of this message series called First. And uh, the point of this message series is this, to help us learn how to put God first, not only in our living, but also in our giving. And, and that's really what Jesus talked about in our focus verse, this, this, when Jesus was preaching uh, the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 6, 33. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Think about it. Salvation, peace, hope, joy, love, a new identity, a, a new sense of belonging, a loving relationship with God. Everything that we will need in this life and in the life that is promised to come will be given to us. This is a promise that you and I can claim when we choose to put God first. You and I, that's what Jesus is talking about. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and he will give you everything you need. That's a great promise. It's a great promise. This idea of putting God first though, let's not kid ourselves. It's not an easy thing to do, is it? Because we're human, right? And, and things like video cameras that won't work and internet that doesn't work and distractions, there's always something that keeps us, pulls us away from keeping God in first place. Last week, we talked about some of that stuff, how there's those things in our lives that get in the way, and, and some of them become so important and so ingrained in our lives that they basically become an idol. They become a thing, something, a person, an activity, whatever it might be, something that competes with God for first place in our life. And so today we're going to move on and we're going to move into this idea of, of not just the competition, but the challenge of getting some of those idols out of the way. We're going to talk about getting the challenge of getting some of those idols out of the way. And specifically today, get ready to groan, we're going to be talking about the biggest idol maker of them all, our money. Okay, you ready? Everybody go, oh. Yeah, right? Because it's bad enough you had to get up on a cold and snowy Sunday morning and drive all the way here to the building, or those of you that are watching online, and then you got to hear about the pastor talk about money. And for those of you that are going to be watching this video online, do not turn it off. Just keep listening. It's okay. But yes, we're going to be talking about the biggest idol maker of them all, our money. Because here's the thing. Money and the stuff that it buys are the things that most easily pull us off track in our lives. And so the question is, how do we, how do you and I put God or really make God first with our money? Well, if you have your Bible with you today, or uh, maybe you prefer to use a Bible app on your phone, that's okay too, but go ahead and open it to the Old Testament book of 2 Chronicles. We're going to be looking uh, at the Old Testament book of 2 Chronicles. We're going to be in chapter 31, and we're going to be reading today and looking at and thinking about the first 10 verses, because in those first 10 verses are some biblical and somewhat difficult challenges that will help us help us each accomplish making God first in our finances, making God first with our money. So when you're reading through the book of Second Chronicles, by the time you get to chapter 31, you're reading about the people of Judah and, and about this guy named King Hezekiah. Now, before Hezekiah, however, became their king, the people of Judah had some other kings. And, and those kings were, were, were not the best kind of guys. And, and they offered some idols to the people and actually suggested that they worship these idols, that they put these idols in their life, and, and they really distracted them from their worship of God. And so 
these idols kind of pulled them away from God. So along comes this guy named King Hezekiah, and, and King Hezekiah was different. He was a good and, and godly king, and, and he didn't want the people worshiping any more these, these dead and useless things. And so he just challenged the people. He said, I want to challenge you to do a little house cleaning, if you will. I want to challenge you to first return to your temple worship, to return to the roots of your faith, but also to get rid of your idols. And so he challenged the people not only to clear the temple of idols and get back to worship, but he also challenged them to go back to their towns and their homes and, and their lives and get rid of all the idols that were there as well. And so let's get into Second Chronicles chapter 31, beginning with verse 1, and read a little bit about what's going on here. When the festival ended, the Israelites who attended went to all the towns of Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh, and they smashed all the sacred pillars. They cut down the Asherah poles. They removed the pagan shrines and altars. After this, the Israelites returned to their own towns and homes. Hezekiah then organized the priests and the Levites into divisions to offer the burnt offerings and peace offerings and to worship and give thanks and praise to the Lord at the gates of the temple. So, Chapter 31 begins right after they had finished celebrating Passover. Passover in the Jewish faith is kind of like our Easter, right? It's a big thing, but for many, many decades now, for, for years, they had kind of gotten away from that because they had gotten kind of wrapped up into worshiping all these other idols. And so they had just finishing, finished celebrating Passover. And King Hezekiah had put that challenge out, and, and it says that the people took up that challenge. And this they didn't see this as a challenge from King Hezekiah. They saw this as a challenge coming to them from God through King Hezekiah. And so we're told that they went out and they broke down and they cut down and they smashed all the pillars and the poles and the shrines and the altars. In other words, friends, they went out and got rid of their idols. They didn't just leave them standing and, and say to their neighbor, hey, you know what, we can, we can just walk by those things and ignore them. We, we, we just won't pay any attention to them from now on. They took the challenge seriously and they got rid of their idols. And, and by doing that, what we see here is they began to once again put God first in their life. They, they began restoring worship to their land and giving thanks and praise to God. Now I realize that all of that is Old Testament stuff that happened centuries and centuries ago. But you know what, folks? We've got a lot in common with those people. Because we also live in a culture that offers us a lot of idols. We live in a culture that offers us a lot of things that we can worship besides God, especially things in our financial lives. We have stuff in our finances, and, and all of us do. If we think hard enough, if we look hard enough at our bank account, we've got things in our finances that competes with God that keeps us from, from fully putting God first in that part of our life. And so these two verses, we're only two verses in to, verse, to chapter 31, but, but they are already reminding us of the importance of stopping every once in a while and just cleansing that stuff from our lives. Not simply ignoring it, not just giving it lip service, but getting rid of it completely. Back in the, in the spring of 2016, Karen and I, we were, we were getting prepared for our son's wedding. Our son Eric was getting married later that fall, and, and we realized that um, we had not been living and eating as healthy as we should have. We had a little more right here than what we wanted, and so that spring, we decided we needed to eat healthier. And the very first thing we did when we made that decision 
is we went through and cleansed our refrigerator and pantry. And I'm not talking taking soapy water and wiping it down. We went through and threw away food that needed to be thrown away, and if it hadn't been used, we gave it away. We gave away boxes of pasta and all that stuff because we cut out carbs for the most part. But we gave them away to people that needed or to food pantries. We just went through and anything that was standing in the way of Karen and I eating healthier and living into this healthier lifestyle, we got rid of. We cleansed our house of our food items that year. About 20 years before that, we did the same thing with our finances. Some of you know the story that there was a portion of my life that I was a used car salesman. And I was not a very good used car salesman. Uh, we, uh, I wasn't selling enough cars, and we were living above our means in some ways. We had more bills than sometimes we had income, and, and we realized that we needed to make a change. And so we went that year, we went through, and we got rid of payments. And, and I always joke, we sold everything that wasn't nailed down. You know, we got rid of things and payments, anything that stood in the way of where Karen and I wanted to be with our finances. Again, that year, we cleansed our budget of all the items. And you know what we found in both of those cases when we cleansed our finances of idols and when we cleansed our, our food idols? Do you know what we found? We found space. We found space. We found space in our refrigerator and in our pantry and in the waste of our pants. We found space in our bank account that we had never experienced before. Space that allowed us to live healthier and to eat healthier. Space that allowed us to, to give more to God and to the church and, and also to give above and beyond that to be a blessing to others who may have been in need around us. And the good news is, folks, in all that space, we didn't miss anything. We didn't miss a thing. We found out that in that space in our finances, we still had all that we needed to take vacations. We found that we still had all we needed to support some of my crazy hobbies and, and to, to be good and, and have fun with our family. In all that space, we didn't miss a thing. We would go out to eat with groups of folks, and, and while they were eating pizza and steak and baked potatoes, we might be eating a salad and a scrambled egg, but we didn't miss a thing. We found that we could still do all that, and it allowed us to do more. It allowed us to do some amazing things for God and for our church and for others. So if you're taking messages this morning, I want to I wanna remind you that I purposely leave a great big spot on the back of the bulletin, and I don't tell you what to write here very often, but if you're taking messages, you might want to write this down. This is the first challenge to making God first with our money. Cleanse your finances. Go through your bank account or your checkbook if you still use one of those. Go through it. Where are you spending your money? Where might you eliminate some of that? How might God help you work through that? Cleanse your finances. Now, I know, friends, I know because I didn't always used to stand on this stage preaching that direction. I used to sit right out there like you guys are hearing it. And I know that sermons about money and having somebody tell you what to do with your money is not very popular. But here's the thing. I'm not telling you what to do with your money, guys, because very clearly the Bible talks a lot about money. I don't know if you're aware of this, but, but in the Bible there's something like 40 verses about baptism. Baptism's a pretty big thing in the church, right? There's about 275 verses about prayer, 350 verses about faith, 650 verses about love, but when it comes to our material possessions and how we use them and how we give from them, get this. There's something like 2,350 verses on that. So you see, I'm not standing up here telling you anything about your money. God is. God's talking to us today. And the bottom line is God has a lot to say about money 
Not our money, but the money that God blesses us with. I forgot one statistic in there. Um, supposedly, I read this somewhere, that, that out of the 39 parables that Jesus told, and, and let's not split hairs because some will say he only told 36 parables, but 39, 11 of the 39 had to do with money. Supposedly, in his parables, Jesus talked more about money than he did about heaven and hell. Isn't that amazing? So God is talking to us today, and I say all of this to bring us to the second point, and then I'll show you where this second point comes from. So the next challenge, if you will, to, to putting or making God first in our finances is once we've cleansed our finances, God wants us to give from those finances. God wants us to give from our finances. And God wants us to do that not because God needs anything. Friends, I love Crosswind Community Church. I love all of you for who you are and what you bring here. But you know what? God doesn't need this place. God doesn't need what we're going to put in the offering box. But please, please put something in there. But, but understand, God doesn't need us to give. We need to give. We need to give. And that's why God urges us to do that, because we have a human need to give. When you and I give in obedience to God's will for our lives, it helps us put God first. Not just in our giving, but in our living as well. And that's kind of what King Hezekiah is impressing upon the people in today's Bible reading. And so let's continue. Let's get back to verse 3 because we got a few verses to go and, and let's read a little more of what's going on. The king also made a personal contribution of animals for the daily morning and evening burnt offerings, the weekly Sabbath festivals, the monthly new moon festivals, and the annual festivals as prescribed in the law of the Lord. In addition, he required the people in Jerusalem to bring a portion of their goods to the priests and the Levites so they could devote themselves fully to the law of the Lord. So here we have this King Hezekiah. He's asking, he's challenging the people to get rid of your idols and to give, but he is not asking them to do anything that he won't do himself. And so he gives first. He gives first to support the temple worship to support the, the Levites and the priests. And then he asked the people to follow his example. Karen and I do the same thing. We give 10% a tithe of our income each and every week to this church, to Crosswind Church. And then on top of that, we give to other ministries and missions that we find a, a passion for that we want to support. And we don't do that so that I can stand up here a couple of times a year when I'm preaching about giving and brag to you about that. We do it because we feel like it's the right thing for us to do. We, we feel like it's the faithful thing for us to do. We feel like it's what God is calling us to do. It's our way of being obedient to God, but also it is our way of being a good example for those of you and for our family and our kids and our grandkids. And so because King Hezekiah gave the way he gave, what we are going to read about here is the people also gave as well. Let's continue. Look at verse 5. The people of Israel responded immediately and generously by giving the first of their crops and grain, new wine, olive oil, honey, and all the produce of their fields. They brought a large quantity, a tithe of all they produced. The people who had moved to Judah from Israel and the people of Judah themselves brought in the tithes of their cattle, sheep, and goats, and a tithe of the things that had been dedicated to the Lord their God, and they piled them up in great heaps. They began piling them up. Excuse me, in the late spring, and the heaps continued to grow until early autumn. When King Hezekiah and his officials came and saw these huge piles, they thanked the Lord and his people Israel. In these verses, we're going to see the third challenge for you and I to put God first in our money. But, but before we get to it, I want to bring us back to, to verse 5. Notice what it says in verse 5. They, meaning the people, responded generously 
by bringing the first share, a tithe of all they produced. Now, money wasn't a big thing back then, right? It was kind of a barter system. So they brought in the first grains of their harvest. They brought in the first of their sheep and goats and whatever else. They gave generously, not from what was left over. Notice what it says there. It didn't say they responded by giving generously of what they had left after they took care of themselves. They gave generously and they gave first. They gave from the first share. And because of how they gave, because of how they responded to this challenge to put God first, we see here that the people were blessed. And what we're, we're going to learn uh, in verse 10 when we get there is not only were the people were blessed by their giving, but God was blessed as well. I, I'm reminded here of a Dave Ramsey uh, quote. Um, Dave Ramsey, by the way, uh, uh, Financial Peace University. How many here have been part of Financial Peace University maybe in the past? We've got a few in here. Uh, you're going to hear a little bit more about that because it's going to be coming up here uh, later this month, or February, excuse me. But Dave Ramsey would say it this way. When someone asked Dave Ramsey, how are you? He'd say, better than I deserved. You see, these people were giving generously. They were giving as if they were better than they deserved. And so here's a third challenge for us this morning. Not only do we need to cleanse our finances and then give from our finances, but we need to live into generosity. As much as King very much like King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah kind of asked the people to give, right? And, and God, really, in the Bible, God commands you and I to give. But here's the good news, friends. God doesn't force us to give. God doesn't say anywhere in the Bible, if you don't give 10% of your income to the local church every week, I don't love you anymore. God commands us to give. God loves us. You see, God wants us to give not out of guilt or shame. God wants us to give generously out of love and faith in God. God wants us to give generously out of love and faith that no matter what we give, God is going to supply still all that we need. You know, in, in modern churches these days, especially in America, whenever you get into a message like this, there always seems to be that debate about tithing. Tithing is an Old Testament thing, and, and Jesus did away with that and just said, be joyful, and, and here's the thing. I don't see the Bible teaching that tithing for us is to be a matter of should I or shouldn't I do this. Our giving is about giving generously. It's about living into generosity. It's not about following a rule. It's about living into generosity. And, and that requires us asking ourselves, am I willing to be obedient to God in everything? Am I willing to be obedient to God by coming to worship on Sunday morning, whether in a building or online? Am I willing to be obedient to God with my finances? Am I willing to trust God with my money? And I realize that some of you hearing this message are, are sitting there right now going, Pastor Kevin, I hear you. I hear you, and, and I get it, and I really want to, but I don't have that 10% space in my bank account right now. I, I really want to, but I just don't have the money in my budget right now. And if that's you, it's okay. It's okay. This is not a point of shame. This is, I just, I want you to hear again. Go back and look at verse 7. I want you to see in verse 7, those of you that are feeling like that right now, because you'll notice in verse 7 where it says that it took them four or five months to bring all that offering in. In other words, the people responded right away. They began giving generously, but it was a process for them. It didn't happen immediately. And so when it comes to this challenge of our 
giving or living in the generosity of our putting God first in our giving, it's not an all or nothing thing. Don't sit there today, please, and hear this message and go, well, I don't have 10%, so I'm done. That's not it. What I'm saying today is take a financial step of faith. If you can't tithe right now, that's okay. Then, then make a percentage leap of faith. This is where Karen and I began because our pastor challenged us years ago when we weren't there. I was a starving car salesman with too many payments. But what we did is we figured out what percentage we were giving at that point in time. And, and if I remember right, it was about 2%. We were giving about 2% of our income. And so what we did is we made a decision right then we were going to begin giving 3%. So my challenge is, if you can't tithe, become a percentage giver. Become a percentage giver. Figure out where you're at now and, and increase your giving by 1% or 2% this year. And then next year, do the same and the same and the same again until, you're, until you reach that, that goal of tithing plus. Or here's another idea. Maybe this is a place where you can start. And I love this idea. Become a fifth-week tither. Four times a year. There's months with five Sundays. There's four five Sunday months. And so on those months when there's a fifth Sunday, that Sunday, that fifth Sunday, choose to give 10% of your paycheck that week. Now please, friends, remember this. The fifth Sunday always comes at the end of the month. And I know that a lot of bills come at the first of the month. There is a challenge in here. God is asking you to be obedient. God is just looking for us to make a financial step of faith. How we approach putting God first in our finances, however, friends, hear this, is not just about formulas and percentages. It's about faith and love. The faith and love that we have for God and the, and the faithfulness and the love that God has for us. And so as you're looking at these three challenges up here, I want to challenge you to do this. I want to challenge you to pray. Pray about your, specifically your giving to this church right now. Because I, I believe that this is the first place of giving. You should support the congregation that you're worshiping at, that you want to see do ministry. And so I want to ask you to begin praying today about your giving to this church. And I want to challenge you today to be obedient to what God tells you in that time of prayer. I want to challenge you to fully trust God with your money. And if you do that, if you do that, I will tell you this. I, I believe this. I've experienced it. It will deepen your faith and it will grow you in ways you never thought possible. And you're going to find yourself living into your faith and into your finances in ways you never thought were possible before. So let's finish reading the story because there's more to be seen yet. Let's pick up at verse 9. Where did all this come from? Remember, remember they've been collecting for months. There was piles and piles of grain and sheep and cattle and whatever else. They were, it was a pile, right? They said, where did all this come from? Hezekiah asked the priests and the Levites. And Azariah, the high priest, from the family of Zadok replied, since the people began bringing their gifts to the Lord's temple, we've had enough to eat and plenty to spare. The Lord has blessed his people and all this is left over. You see, the priests and the Levites, much like me, your pastor, they were not allowed to go out and have a, a side job to earn some money to their, their, their responsibility was to serve the temple and the people were to supply and meet their needs. And so what this is saying is not only did the people give enough to take care of the temple and the temple worship and, and feed the, the Levites and the priests and all of their families, but there was plenty left over. Friends, guess what they could do with that leftover? They could give it to the community, right? They could reach out beyond themselves. And that's what I am praying for for Crosswind, is that 
you will continue to be generous in such a way that will not only meet the financial needs of this building in, these, in this space, but we will have enough to, to move beyond ourselves into our community in ways we never have before. I love that line, the Lord blessed his people and all this is left over. Putting God first in our finances, giving generously isn't meant to be a burden. Please don't hear this as a burden. It's meant to be a blessing. It becomes a blessing. And, and this verse reminds us that, that the more we give, the more God is going to bless us if we choose to put God first in our living and giving. This is the message that God wants us to hear today, I believe. And that's this. Cleanse, give, and live. Cleanse, give, and live. Not just in our finances, that's a good place, but, but in our entire life. In our house, how many of us are going to go home today like Karen and I and pull in our garage and barely be able to squeeze your car? Yeah, some of you, right? Yeah, cleanse, give, and live. It's about moving out all that other stuff so that we've got room to put God first in everything. That's what God wants for us. That's what I hope you heard from God today. So let's pray. Let's pray, shall we? God, thank you for speaking to us today from this, this Old Testament passage, from challenging us, from in some ways, God, making us squirm a little bit in our seats. And, but most importantly, God, thank you for the example of Jesus who, who really showed us what it means to give everything for you. Thank you for the example of Jesus who showed us what it means to be obedient to your will above everything else. God, right now, for, for each and every one of us that are, that are hearing these words and that are praying right now, God, will you give us the wisdom and the faith and the courage to step out in faith, to be obedient to you, to be obedient to what you may be calling each of us to do, not only in our living, but in our giving, with our money and our possessions, with our time and our talents and our abilities, how, God, are you calling us to be generous in serving you and growing your kingdom? God, thank you for the promise that we can never outgive you. Thank you for the promise that you are always faithful. And so, God, we, we just want to tell you how much we love you. And we want to place our trust in you. And so God, give us the strength and the courage to do that. We pray that in all things in Jesus' name. Amen.